Welcome. Thank you for joining us. This is the last salon talk for the day, Art Basel Miami Beach, LA then and now. We're very excited. Um, please welcome Brett Easton Ellis, Alex Israel, and Hans Ork over us. Hey, guys. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our uh, salon today with uh, Brett and Alex. And please give another very, very warm welcome to Brett Easton Ellis and Alex Israel. Getting here was a bitch, but we got here. It was very uh, rush, rushing like crazy, but we finally made, made it. it. I'm a little sweaty, <laughs> but we're, I think, capable yeah, there was of a doing drama, this. A drama on the bridge, a one hour a drama. traffic jam on the bridge. But anyway, <laughs> everybody is uh, here, and maybe we begin with the beginning. Uh, I wanted to ask you both how it all started. Uh, we're doing kind of three chapters. I thought maybe we can begin with a prelude, um, how it all began, how you, you met for the first time? Uh, well, um, I lived in New York for many years after living in Los Angeles. And um, when I came back to Los Angeles, this was roughly around 2006, I was kind of shocked by the burgeoning LA art scene. It was very different than it was when I left. And there were many more galleries, uh, a lot more gallerists, and uh, there was a real like sense of a movement happening. And I found myself being interviewed, uh, um, asked to go to certain dinners and art openings, and I met a lot of gallerists, and I met a lot of artists, and one of them was Alex. And I was interested somewhat in his work, and we became friendly. He interviewed me a couple of times, and we collaborated briefly on one of Alex's art pieces. And then he approached me about a year ago to uh, collaborate with him on this new project, which we announced yesterday, uh, on, a, on a number of very large scale paintings um, that we uh, ultimately collaborated on and that will be on view in February. And I think that's how we met. If I'm leaving anything out, tell me. Yeah, no, that's it. You told that story very well. Um, uh, yeah, we met, it was a Regan Projects dinner and um, I was a big fan of Brett's work for a long time and um, was so excited to meet him and wanted to interview him for Purple, which is a magazine that I used to do interviews for when I was a student. And I remember asking you um, if I could interview you and you kept saying like, oh, I don't know, ask my publicist. And, and so I bugged your publicist and finally I don't know if that's true. It's true, it's true. I don't have a publicist. Or it, it was, it was Random not, House's publicist. Uh, okay, was, but I'm was, pretty, I'm pretty yeah. open, you know, so I'm, just, I'm a kind of available, so. <laughs> I don't know, hey, you mentioned the publicist story a couple of times, I'm not, I'm not sure it, about that. But. It, was, um, it was right as you were promoting the book, the new book, Imperial Bedrooms. Okay. And I guess all press was going through the publisher. So, you are correct, so that's that is why. true. And then she uh, okayed me, and then we met and um, did the interview. And then we did, uh, Brett was on As It Lays, uh, which was an artwork of mine. And then we just kind of um, became friends. And then um, one night, I took Brett to dinner at the mall and asked him if he wanted to do a series of paintings with me. And then he said yes, and then we started this new project, which well, I guess- dinner at the mall, how could I say no? I mean, it was like- <laughs> Uh, and it's, it was a nice mall, though. It's, it's, yeah, it's, no, it's, it's, it's the nice Beverly mall. Center. It's not. It's, it wasn't like a strip mall, but anyway. Now that I'm debunking the myth, the origin story of how this all started, but I feel the need to clarify some things. And obviously, it started also, Alex, when you read Brad's book, and you once told me that you actually were super inspired as a teenager by by Brad's book and. Uh, Read his work. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about the impact it, it had on you and, and what, what inspired you and which books of Brett inspired you? Well, all of them, but um, the first one that I read was Less Than Zero. And um, I read it on the airplane coming home for the holidays from my freshman year in college. And if you read the book, that's exactly what the main character is doing. He's going home um, for the holidays in the freshman year, his freshman year of college. So I felt this kind of immediate connection. And, um, and then the book goes on to kind of describe uh, Westwood Village in the 80s. And that's where and when I grew up. So there was a real kind of um, kindred spirit that I found in the writing. And, um, and I felt a really strong connection to it. 
Uh, maybe uh, because this morning there was a conversation, uh, Brett, you had with uh, Elizabeth Chandler, it was a, a Goodreads conversation, and we went there with, uh, with Tina Korek, and it had a lot to do with process and the process of um, uh, how to write. And can you maybe tell us a little bit about the genesis of Less Than Zero? What was, was there an epiphany, or how, how did you come to the book? How did the book come to you? Um, I had written, uh, it's crazy to look back now, but I was interested in novels as a very young kid. So I was reading novels like at seven, eight, nine. Uh, not just young adult, but like adult novels, like books my mom bought, like Jacqueline Suzanne or Harold Robbins or whatever. So I was really, I, I love novels. And so I wrote a novel when I was 14. It was about my experiences. Uh, uh, I, I had uh, done very badly in school. And instead of going to summer school, my parents sent me to one of my relatives kind of cheap hotel up in um, <clears throat> Elko, Nevada, where um, I worked as a busboy for uh, the summer. And I, and I wrote about that, that was my first novel. And then I started, and that was when I was 14, around 15 or 16, I began the notes for this book, for Less Than Zero. And it really was based on a lot of, um, uh, like diary entries, uh, it was very journalistic. It was just about what I was experiencing as an LA teen in the early 80s. And so um, it, the book took many forms until it was finally published, uh, but its roots really were in kind of a journalistic, uh, neorealistic quality and very influenced by the California writer Joan Didion. Um, and so when I finally did the, the, when I did the final draft of the book that was ultimately published, it had come a long way from being this kind of uh, journalistic, impressionistic book into a kind of more tightly constructed work of fiction. But um, that's, that's, that's the genesis of Lesson Zero. And John Didion leads us right away also back to Alex, because she's also a great inspiration for your work. Can you tell us about, about that, Alex? Well, yeah, um, the title for my uh, talk show, As It Lays, is based off of, it's an homage to Play It As It Lays, a novel by Didion. And um, yeah, I was also really inspired by her writing. Um, and, and Brett actually talks about her writing in a really, you know, in, in a way that kind of resonates for how I felt about it, which is it's kind of a, a minimalist approach, a very direct way of writing. And that kind of, that clarity, that really spoke to me as well. Um, I was rereading this uh, morning again, you know, the different interviews we had done together. And obviously the first one, Alex, you made with Brad was the purple you mentioned in 2010 in Purple Magazine. And you start the interview with actually asking Brad, you grew up in Southern California, what was the best thing about it? So I wanted to ask you both, what is the best thing about growing up in Southern California? Uh, oh, sorry, uh, the Xanax just kicked in. I just I took one. Thank God. I tell and I realized that I'm just suddenly quite comfortable. And um, the question is about what was the best thing about growing up in Southern California? Um, uh, well, look, the thing that I always, uh, it's very simple. It was really the, um, it was the geography of the place. It was this wide open space that spread from the ocean to the mountains. You could get from one to the other in about 30 minutes. Um, it was the light, but it was really the mobility. It was kind of the freedom to roam. And that freedom intensifies when you are 15 and a half or 16 and you start to drive and you have a car, uh, which is very unlike a lot of my friends who grew up in urban places like New York or Chicago. That wasn't, that wasn't such the case. And so it was kind of this mobility, this freedom that you experienced um, that I don't know, also influenced, I think, the range of my work. I, it's a very tricky thing to say, and, to, and, and it's an idea that's hard to grasp, but the idea of having this kind of mobility and freedom really kind of leaked into other aspects of my life, and it really leaked into the idea that I could go as far as I did, for, for example, in my fiction. I really do connect those two things. So I would have to say that um, that and just, um, I don't know, and that moment in LA culture in the early 80s when I really did become a teen, it was very different. It was a much more innocent time. And, and just very surfacey things were fun. The beach is fun, mall culture was fun, um, you know, punk culture, which was coming out of, well, California punk culture, which was coming out of LA at the time. I don't know, I, I, I kind of liked it all um, until I didn't, until I started writing Less Than Zero. That's when the darkness started 
to come in. But for a while, I was okay. Alex, what about you? You said once in a conversation we had that it dawned on you that the light, the water, the waves, the surface, the sprawl, the cast, the status, and the city's unique spirit kind of play a role for you as an inspiration growing up there. What is it that inspired you? Well, all of those things that you just listed, um, and, and, you know, the frozen yogurt is great in L.A., and we have um, great radio stations, and um, I don't know, great, like lots of things, like little things that, um, that you take for granted when you grow up there. But, but I also think um, it's a unique place because there's no real public transportation that's any good. So um, you really have like a kind of prolonged childhood until you do turn 16 and you drive. And in other places, when you turn 12, you know, you're on the subway going around the city, but in L.A., that's not the case. And, um, and there's maybe a longer period of incubation um, where you get to be a kid a little bit longer. Now, maybe also we could come back to something we discussed when we met together for the first time. Actually, uh, in L.A., you talked also about some kind of darker influences of L.A. And, Brett, you said that you... Uh, some of them are deeply uh, influenced by the Manson murders and, and, and actually uh, Bugliosi's Helter Skelter also was an important kind of early inspiration. Can you tell us about that? Oh, you, um, you meant specifically the Manson murders? Yeah. Well, they were. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't escape from them. I mean, they did define the city for decades and decades and still to, to a degree do. But the, the, the notion that in L.A., because it's so spread out, it's so open, uh, people did leave their doors unlocked that you know, someone could be roaming the canyons and just decide upon your house and you know, cause that kind of um, carnage really haunted everybody for decades in uh, California. And it really did define uh, the... It, it debunked the friendliness of the city, let's put it that way. It debunked the notion that everything was kind of all connected. We were all getting together. We all loved one another. It was, you know, this, that, that laid back LA feeling was really decimated for a while with the Manson murders because, you know, Manson did know that house and he had been there many times. But um, just that was, um, you know, was haunting, and it, and it really does, uh, it, it did inform a lot of the paranoia and I think the dread that infuses a lot of my work that is about Los Angeles in particular. And Alex, for you? Uh, for me, uh, darker things, darker sides to the city, I don't know, I, uh, I don't know, you know, I grew up in the 80s, and it was a different kind of moment in Los Angeles history, and it was a moment when you know, Los Angeles had sent Ronald Reagan off to be president and tons of new development happened in the city. And I think it was a more optimistic period, I think, by the time I was born in the city. So, um, so I think that that had a bigger influence on me than kind of the darkness of maybe the 70s. Well, it was not only, it through. wasn't only, yeah. it was really, well, there was a great, exciting pessimism in L.A. too in the late 70s. I'm older than Alex, and so it was, I, I did experience it, that as a teenager, this kind of, the defeat of the 70s, of the aftermath of Watergate, the aftermath of Vietnam, and just this kind of pessimism that was really quite thrilling, affected the arts, it affected music, and definitely Less Than Zero was attuned to that, and that was definitely an influence. But the pessimism wasn't like a downer, it was exciting. I mean, it made some great movies, it made some great music, and some really great fiction, too. Now, the moment you met uh, and your kind of dialogue and collaboration started is a very different moment than the Less Than Zero moment. It's the moment, Brett, you wrote, uh, and actually, um, just released Imperial Bedrooms, and that's Alex says was the moment you did this first interview, was the moment of the release of that book. So I wanted to ask you, Brad, what prompted this idea to write the sequel to, to Less Than, uh, Than Zero, and also kind of what had changed, because it seems, also from previous conversations, you had other inspirations. Chandler had become important. Uh, LA was a very different city. Can you tell us a little bit about well, look, every book really bec uh, it becomes about where I'm at at a certain time. So Less Than Zero was a reflection of where I was at. Regardless if I shared any characteristics with that narrator, he definitely was emblematic of the sort of person I knew. And there were certain things about him that I identified with. And 
he and I was interested at a certain point in my life about seven, eight years ago when I was having a very going through a very dark period. For some reason, I wondered where is he now? That guy who everyone thinks is my alter ego from the novel Less Than Zero, where at the end he goes through the darkness, but he manages to escape. I mean, the last three words of that book are after I left, which I don't know if I would have kept now. Um, but there, there was a there was a hint of optimism in a way that he got out of this this place alive. But um, 25 years later, uh, I, was a, I was a different person, and I was going through a much darker phase, and I wondered where he was now. I just wondered where, what would he be doing? Um, <clears throat> what, was his, what would his mindset be? And it kind of reflected my much darker mindset than I had when I was 19 or 18 and working on that book. Um, but it really, the only differences uh, in the city are, you know, they're um, they're just they're, they're surfacey. I mean, they're really about construction and about how blown out LA has become since 1984, 1985. But I don't know if that was as interesting to me as what was going on within the mind and the soul of this character. I don't know how what Imperial Bedrooms reflects differently than Less Than Zero reflects, except perhaps uh, more of an obsession with celebrity and with, um, you know, uh, in a way, making it in Hollywood, which in 2007, 2008, 2009, when I was working on that novel, seemed to be the last vestiges of that happening, the idea of coming to LA and making it in that business. And since the business has kind of imploded, people don't really do that anymore. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the young actress that he becomes involved with. I don't know if that type exists anymore because people can become stars on YouTube. They don't need to get on a bus and come out to LA anymore. Yeah, I noticed the other day that they closed the Greyhound bus station in Hollywood. Yes, that's, yeah, that's it, sign of the times. Now for both of you, LA is kind of a a reflecting pool, and that's obviously kind of ironic also, given the fact that it's a drought. Um, and Alex, I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about this reflecting pool, LA East, because obviously it inspires a lot of your work. Um, Brad spoke about, spoke about Less Than Zero, about Imperial Bedrooms, so it inspires a lot of your work. And, um, you know, rereading here the first sentence of Less Than Zero, it starts with, people are afraid to merge on freeways in Los Angeles, uh, freeways, that also to your sunglasses project. Can you tell us about a little bit more about this reflecting pool, LA's, for you? Well, yeah, I probably, I don't know if I would have named my sunglasses brand Freeways had it not been for that first sentence in Brett's novel. Um, but um, in terms of LA as a reflecting pool, I mean, I don't know, I guess, um, I, don't, I don't think of it in those terms, I just think of it as a kind of um, a material like an ever-changing and evolving material um, as a physical place, as an ethos, and as um, the place that produces, um, you know, our, our popular culture, um, which is also, you know, hugely inspiring to me as an artist, as a kind of material in my work. So um, for me, it's like a, it's like a, you know, just a material bank. Um, and for me, it's kind of a personal thing because the three books that I've published that are about Los Angeles really are just reflections of where I was at at a certain point. And I don't know if I was necessarily attuned into where the idea of the city was at. And if I was, it was reflected through the character and what he was going through. So given that there were all these you know, contact zones and that there were all these uh, dialogues you had, something then definitely happened uh, um, then you started to go deeper into a collaboration. Can you maybe tell us what prompted it? Because I think Alex has had to do with you working with a film writer and you somehow yeah. wanting to kind of have a deeper collaboration with a writer. It would be great to hear about that. Okay, so... Um, uh, that's beginning of chapter two. Okay, <laughs> chapter two. So um, a little bit over a year and a half ago, I started working on a feature length film project uh, a teen surf movie that I'm making called SPF 18. And um, I, I didn't know how to write a screenplay, uh, so I had to hire somebody to help me. And I was thinking, okay, well, who's the best person for this job? Uh, the movie's got to be about you know, the beach, and it's got to be earnest um, for teenagers to kind of um, present a really good message to them. And, 
And so I thought, well, maybe this guy who created Baywatch is the right person to help because Baywatch is about the beach and it's super earnest. There's no irony in Baywatch. Um, so I contacted the man who created it. His name is Michael Burke. And he was really excited to work with me on SPF 18. Um, and we were writing the, the movie, we wrote, wrote the story together, and then he wrote the screenplay. And throughout that process, I was really um, just kind of inspired by the, 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 the process of working with a writer. And I kept thinking, wow, like, this is so great. Maybe there's another way I could work with a writer or, um, or collaborate with a writer in another capacity in my work. And um, that, that idea just kind of stayed with me. Um, and I kept it there, and eventually it kind of turned into this more defined and concrete idea that I had, which was to, to work on, um, to create text, text paintings. And, and, and I thought, well, there's no one I would rather work with and no one who I think is a more, um, you know, exciting and interesting writer in Los Angeles than Brett. So that's how um, I ended up approaching Brett to do this project. And then there was the dinner, right? You mentioned this dinner, that you had this dinner in this mall, and that's yes. where it all starts. It would be great to hear what really happened in this dinner, because I still haven't understood it completely. I know that you collected fragments, and I know that these collected fragments then led to streaming thoughts. Can you tell us what happened there? Well, it, the dinner at the mall, which was a, a very nice restaurant in the Beverly Center, um, was, I think, we had already discussed what the project was, which was I was going to create text for these large scale, eight by eight, seven by eight paintings. And what were these texts going to be? Um, and so what my job was, was to kind of create a narrative, uh, a world that these paintings would take place in. And the text would be re re a reflection of, of the, the images that are going to be on these paintings. And so I kind of created a world. I created a, a scenarios set in Los Angeles with certain reoccurring characters, uh, same houses, uh, narrative trajectories, and then began to whittle them down so there were just two sentences, maybe three sentences, and depending on what the canvas was, they would be laid out on the canvas somehow. And so what Alex did at that dinner at the mall was, I think that was the first night we began to go over the first batch of them. And there were many, many, many of them. And, th and we're talking about a first, I think we're doing about, uh, initially, how many paintings? About 20 or well, 20? Well, you started, I, I remember, um, you started to send me texts and, e and emails. Right. And, um, and we collected them. And then every time we had about 20 different texts, we would go and meet up for dinner. And we would have a little bit too much to drink. And then we would sit and go through all the text together. And, and I think we just kept narrowing things down and whittling things yes. down. And, and then basically, you, you began to find images that you thought would uh, best juxtapose these texts with what, you wanted, what the ideas about Los Angeles for a while was really the subject matter. And, um, and so whittling them down, we would even tighten the narrative more. And so that, this process went on and on until we found the ones that really ultimately worked the best for a show in terms of what, in terms of the, when these are uh, revealed in February, there is a kind of co coherent mood to all of the paintings, even though they're distinct and they're separate. They're, they're, um, they're from the same kind of general idea I had when I first went in about LA, the people in it, where they were working, who they were involved with, were some of them druggy, were some of them not, who was unhappy, who was happy, and that was really how, um, how it came about. Can you maybe give us a few examples for oh, such sure. text? Because you, I mean, it was announced yesterday for the first time that you're doing this collaboration. It's, of course, too early to exactly say how the exhibition will work, but it would be great to just hear a few. OK, my texts, phone is, no? I'm tur I just turned it on, so it takes a second. Well, it's also, it is difficult to, you know, you hear the text, but seeing the text with the image is obvious, you know, that that's what you really want to get, but I don't know, maybe they're, 
Maybe they're good enough as standalones. So some of them are, are more narrative and are about characters. Um, when I saw Stacy on the corner of La Cienega and Holloway outside the CVS, I was instantly torched with dread. That's one. That was one. That was one of the first ones. Yeah, that was the first one. Yeah, that was the first one. Tim dove into the black bottom pool and the fear returned and started swallowing everything up just like it had last summer. Yeah, that's another one. In Los Angeles, I knew so many people who were ashamed that they were born and not made. <laughs> Here's another kind of dark one. The invasion was beginning. I could feel it. The carved grooves at the bottom of my soul, the Kalanapin smile, the place at the end of the map. And then there are some that are more like uh, aphorisms, like, can 50 million people be wrong? Probably. And numbness is a feeling. A wave of dark clouds appeared over the ocean moving parallel to Marcy as she raced across PCH through the traffic, shifting gears, thinking, I'm so fucked. All right, that's a good preview. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now, before we talk about the images, I wanted to ask you both to tell me about uh, the typography and the way these texts are kind of the fonts, the way they are, uh, they are arranged, because you, you choose very specific fonts. They come from different places. Uh, some fonts come from the Hollywood Reporter or from Variety. Yeah, Can you yeah. tell us about this? So um, once we kind of had a certain amount of text that we had both kind of really decided were, were keepers, um, I would then take Brett's texts and kind of turn them into images um, using stock photography and laying them out and using different fonts. And the fonts all were kind of culled from the landscape of Los Angeles. So it was like uh, the Hollywood Reporter font or the Variety font or this, the font that's used for screenplays or um, the Whole Foods Market font, different things like that. So just kind of resourcing from the landscape. And then the images, um, the images somehow, I had initially understood that you appropriated them, but as, I, as far as I understand, it's not really an appropriation. Can you explain how that works? Well, appropriation, uh, I think of appropriation more like shoplifting, but when we collected images for this project, we were just shopping, we just bought them. We didn't steal. Um, we bought them all on, off of the internet. But are, they, are they kind of ready-made? Because obviously... Yeah, yes. You've used ready-mades before in, in your work using all kinds of props, so it's a continuation, one can say. In some way, yeah. Of that. And Brad, what about, what about you in terms of this idea of borrowing or using ready-mades? Because obviously there are lots of moments or different moments in, in your work where you kind of use excerpts or texts from other authors, Hamlet appears, or you use uh, fragments or epigraphs actually from Thomas McGuain, can, can you tell us about this idea of borrowing? Is it, is it appropriation? Is it shopping? Well, I think it's influences. I really don't think I've ever written something where I've actively taken someone else's text and put them into my work. The only time I really did that in a way was when the uh, narrator of one of my novels liked to speak in, speak in contemporary song lyrics. And so he would just talk in song lyrics often when he found himself in a strange situation. But I always just saw myself as being influenced by certain people and never, uh, never really like actually appropriating a text. It was always um, uh, it o it only worked if I was influenced by them. And what about kind of borrowing characters? Because I think it's fascinating that you actually borrowed some characters from other writers in American Psycho. You incorporated a character from Tana Janowitz's uh, Slaves of New York, and then I think 
a character also from Jay McInerney's story of my life, which was kind of a way to express your upset with him. Can you tell us about this idea of borrowing characters? That's so strange. I, I haven't thought about that in a very long time, Hans. Um, Leave it to Hans to do that. <clears> the <throat> really. I did. I, when I was writing American Psycho, I did place one of Jay McInerney, who was a contemporary of mine, who is a contemporary of mine, uh, one of his characters in a moment of peril with Patrick Bateman. Uh, I did it because I was pissed at Jay, and he had done something that kind of annoyed me. I thought it was kind of dickish of him. And so it was kind of an inside joke, and I really didn't think anybody was going to notice it or if they did be so upset. It's just really the name of one of his characters in a book that I didn't think that many people were familiar with. But Jay knew, and he was quite upset with it. I don't know why I'm telling this story. It's so random. But um, So yes, that's one way of doing it. The thing that I do do is I use characters from my own work over and over and over again. And they do tend to... Um, they do tend to reoccur in my fiction. Why I do it, I don't know. There really is not a plan. It's just something that feels right. Um, and, I, you know, Patrick Bateman first appeared in The Rules of Attraction, a novel I published in 87, at the very end of the book. And when I was working on American Psycho, I couldn't really figure out who this guy was. And then for some reason it was, how about Sean Bateman's brother, who is in that cafeteria scene at the end of Rules of Attraction, and that was how it worked. And I, and I don't have any kind of specific reasons for why I do it. It's just, it feels right. So we've talked about the, the works. You have the texts and the images. You bring it together uh, in these uh, paintings, one can say, because you said that they were very inspired, actually, by, by Warhol also yesterday. How will the exhibition work? And also, it's kind of interesting maybe to hear a little bit more about the timing of the exhibition, because you kind of contextualize oh. the exhibition in a timing not only of the art world, but also of the world of cinema. Yeah, we wanted the... Um, because the subject matter of this project is so uh, LA-focused, we wanted to kind of present the work in a context that felt like the most kind of, I don't know, heightened Hollywood kind of situation for art to be presented in. And that's um, the annual Oscar week opening at Gagosian in Beverly Hills. Um, because it's really a kind of coming together of Hollywood and the art world in our city. And so that's kind of what we had hoped would be the best and thought would be the best way of kind of presenting the work. and. Um, that's what ended up happening, is we're going to be showing the work, and it'll be opening right before the Oscars um, in, our, in L.A. But to, to talk about um, Warhol, yeah, there's something about the way that they're made that comes out of Warhol. I, I went and saw the Warhol Shadow Paintings show when it was up at MoCA, and um, there's this amazing thing about how Warhol just kind of did all this kind of messy paint underneath these silk screens. And um, piece after piece, there's just this kind of underpainting. And, and I looked at it, and I, was, and I just couldn't decide uh, if the painting made these works warmer or colder, cooler. And I liked not ever being able to figure that out and that kind of, um, that, that they raised that question for me. So um, I decided, we decided to borrow that technique and to paint, underpaint um, beneath the, the the overprinted image that we're going to be using for each each work in our series. One thing which I forgot to ask you yesterday is actually if there will be a book. I, is this collaboration also leading to to a book you do together? Yes. Yes. And we don't know so many details about the it's book too yet. Early. Yeah, but <laughs> we're working it out. And will the collaboration continue? Uh, hopefully, yeah. I mean, to do uh, another series of these is. Uh, in, in the works. Yeah, it's it's definitely like a the process is challenging. What you would say, right? It is very challenging, and it was much more challenging than I thought it was going to be. I mean, I look. I believe everything should be enjoyable, intensely enjoyable to a degree. Um, when you're creating something, when you're writing something, when you're making something, but um, this posed a set of challenges that was as at, at, that could be as trying as times as working on a novel. Now, I'm not saying it was like writing a novel. It was very different. But there was, there was an inordinate emphasis on finding the right words that would not only fit together best on a canvas, but would also be imbued with a kind 
of meaning and to do that in such a short amount of time. I mean, you can do that in a paragraph. You have all the time in the world, but to do it in these specific texts was very challenging and to get them to the point where we were happy with it was, it was a long process. It, it took about a year to, to finally, out of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of texts, get them down to the ones that are in the show. Now, when Deleuze Guattari did their book, uh, Mille Plateau, which uh, is an epic book they, they wrote together, they once said in, a, in an interview that there is, of course, a routine in every practitioner's practice, in every artist's practice, in every writer's practice, but it's a kind of a different routine in a collaboration. Um, are there kind of regular meetings you have? Because we, you, know, you told us in a wonderful way the epiphany that was the the mall, you know, the dinner, but how do you then unfold? Are there regular meetings? Is there a routine? Are there sparks? Yeah, so it just kind of continued from, from our first meeting and, and Brett would work on texts, send them to me, and then we would meet, we would discuss them. A lot of times we would, you know, work a lot on them. Sometimes we disagree about them. Sometimes I wanted to push them in a much darker place and get a little uh, violent and scatological. And then usually Alex would pull me back into a kind of reality that that is not going to be really work within the confines of what I want to do. So there was a lot of back and forth, a surprising amount. I really thought that I was going to just do the text and that was it. But there was an, an, an enormous amount of reworking the text and I found, my, I found myself doing a lot of editing and then going over some of Alex's edits and it was, um, it was a process. It was definitely a process. Um, and then I would, I, once we kind of got to a point where we had some, I would start mocking them up as, as, um, as kind of mock-up images. Um, and then this just continued back and forth for a year and I would say we probably would get together and meet like, I don't know, every, every other month or every yeah. six weeks. Yeah and um, have dinner and sit and drink too much and make some decisions and um, yeah. And we kind of started this not knowing like where these things would go or where it would end up or what it would become really, but um, you know, very excited about getting to show them in the coming year. It's extremely exciting. It's obviously also very different from how, you know, usually a collaboration between an artist and and a novelist or a poet would work because very often it's kind of reduced to this idea uh, that there would be a preface or that the writer or a poet or novelist would write a preface to an artist exhibition and here it's really a, a co-authorship. You're co-signing the work, right? Yes, absolutely. So this is the end of part two uh, and we can all look forward to the exhibition now. For part three of this conversation, we thought it would be great to talk a little bit about other things you're working on and what is so fascinating is actually both and we've seen so many, you know, common interests, but also your, both in your practice, film is very important right now. You both have this project on kind of working on films, and I wanted to ask you, Brad, first to tell us about your films. There is a project of The Golden Suicide. Uh, well, yes, there is a project called The Golden Suicides that is about the artists uh, Jeremy Blake and Teresa Duncan. Uh, it's, I wrote a script, I became fascinated by their story about eight years ago, um, and they were a young uh, couple in the arts. Uh, he was 23, she was about 10 years older than him. And it's kind of a Star is Born story. She was on her way up and then he she was nurturing him and his art. Uh, and then as her career was faltering, his career was taking off and she kind of like went mad. She lost her mind and she committed suicide. And he was so connected to her in some way through all these years and so in love with her that about a week later he killed himself too. And this was taken from a Vanity Fair uh, story uh, that, that pu was published about a year after they died and I kind of became obsessed with it. Um, but yes, this is how it works. You know, I did that adaptation in 2008. We're now in t almost at 2016. It's been eight years, there have been people attached and then unattached, and then the money seems to be there. The money seemed to be there this last year, and there seemed to be an actress who was going to play it, and then that kind of fell apart. A director was attached. So, yes, there are various movie projects, but, you know, the movies usually don't get made, and so it's kind of a... Unless you kind of now, in this DIY era, take, um, you know, take hold of the... Um, the making of the movie yourself, which I think is going to increasingly happen and people are not going to be so 
you know, beholden to production entities and, well, studios or whatever. I mean, it's a, it's a much different era now than when I wrote that script. You also told me that there was a kind of a, a shark movie, and I think that had uh, something to do with Paul Schrader, right? There was a kind of a, and it's kind of fascinating because we began to speak about imperial bedrooms, and obviously um, American Gigolo is sort of something which haunts you until today. You reference it actually in the ending of the imperial bedrooms. Can you tell us about this Paul Schrader connection and, um, again, and the shark movie? It's... You <laughs> The shark movie, <laughs> the shock movie. I know the shock movie, the shark movie. But it's um, again, it was just it was an assignment. Like someone, I, I was out in Los Angeles and I had this idea for a movie. And actually, the head of Lionsgate, I, I was having dinner with, said, "I really want to make a good shark movie." And he said, "Do you think you can do it?" And I was just moved back to L. And I said, "Yeah, sure, I can. Make, I can write a shark movie." And not really thinking anything of it. And so I actually wrote a revenge melodrama that takes place on a yacht. There happens to be a school of bullhead sharks that someone falls overboard and is attacked by the sharks. But it's really not a shark movie. I mean, there are some sharks in it, but um, it's not a shark movie. Though I did call it bait. So, you know, people do assume that there's a lot of... Uh, feeding of people to the sharks, but anyway, the movie again. The movie didn't happen. The director Paul Schrader, who had written Taxi Driver and made American Gigolo, was attached to direct it for some time. We had a cast. We had um, Anton Yelchin and Emmy Rossum were going to play the leads, and then the money fell through, as it usually does. So um, that was the that's the genesis for the shark movie that uh, I wrote. Now uh, I think that was ten years ago. I wrote that script. And then there is another film project which actually leads us then straight away to Alex's film project because Alex is working on a, on a film which has connection actually to different soundtracks from the uh, 80s. And you, Brett, had actually um, a dialogue at a certain moment with John Taylor and Nick Rhodes of Duran Duran to do a biopic. Can you tell us about that? There is a rumor. Uh, this, no, a again, a very long time ago, I was approached by um, John Taylor and Nick Rhodes Yes, of the group Duran Duran, and they wanted me to write a biopic about the early days of the band. Um, the problem was that nothing really bad happened to anybody. There was really no overdoses. Everyone kind of like married models and moved into castles, and there was really nowhere to go with the material. And you know, it was like, well, where's the drama in this? You know, Simon Le Bon gets fat. I mean, it's like, what, what do we do with this material? And, um, and so they kind of you know, drifted away and thought, gee, you're right. I don't know what is the dramatic core of the Duran Duran movie. And, um, but yeah, that was, that, was a, that was a discussion I had with them in, I think, 2009 or something. And Alex, it's amazing because you just did a record cover for them, no? Can you tell us? Yes, or I just... Duran Duran ties, it's crazy. <laughs> I did design the um, album, I did the album cover art for their new uh, recent album. And I did it actually in exchange for a song for my movie. Because music licensing is just the hardest thing you can imagine. Um, but um, I was able to procure a great song from them. So that was, that was a great trade. Can you tell us about this, this movie? Because it's a project which... Uh, works, of course, in a, in a similar way to actually uh, Brad's third uh, LA book, which, uh, because we, we talked a lot about your two other LA books, but the third book of the short stories of the, of the informers has a lot to do with teenagers. Your film has a lot to do with, uh, with teenagers. Can you tell us about, about the project? Because it's an epic project you've been working on for a long, long time. Yeah, and, it's, and I'm almost done. Um, I'm just in the final stages of editing, and ho hopefully we'll have a locked cut by the end of the year, knock on my head. Um, but um, it's a coming-of-age movie. It's about teenage kids in the summer between high school and college. And um, they, are, they end up house-sitting for Keanu Reeves in Malibu. And they all kind of have different teenager problems, and they help each other deal with them. Um, but, it's, but it's very um, light-hearted and cute. It's not dark, really, at all. Um, it's about kind of creativity and um, kind of how that helps each one of these kids find their voice. And it's really being made, I'm making it for a, a teenage audience. 
Can you maybe tell us uh, a little bit how it will then again produce reality? Because for us, I understand it will also produce exhibitions that already started. Things will pop yeah. up. Yeah, so um, like for example, one of the um, plot lines in the movie is that this girl, um, her character, she loves surfing. She discovers surfing and she wants to go buy a wetsuit. So she goes to the surf shop, but all the wetsuits are black and she's this kind of girl who needs to express herself through her clothing and she just won't accept that there's no colorful wetsuit. So she takes, them, she takes one and she paints it. And, um, and this wetsuit that she paints, kind of she also makes one for her friend in the movie and um, we, I, it's become a sculpture, a, another self-portrait. Um, I cast, I made one for myself and cast it on my body. And um, so that's one example of a kind of artwork that's come out of the process of making the movie. There are others that I'm working on as well. Wonderful. I had actually, uh, this is end of chapter three, but I've got a couple of uh, postscriptum kind of questions. One thing I was uh, very intrigued by when we met in LA was, uh, Brett, when you said that we asked you about your favorite book and you said the Glamorama was for you uh, your favorite book, your most important book, and uh, I wanted to ask you both, Alex and Brett, to tell us about what you consider your most important work, and start actually with Brett and asking you about uh, Glamorama, which um, in a way uh, for you is the, in your own opinion, most complex book. Well, look, I think writers are kind of notorious for choosing their favorite book, which was the one that got the most attacked in a lot of ways. And so I think I'm a very protective about that book. But I did spend a very long time working on that novel. I did spend about eight years working on it. And it did mean the most to me out of anything that I've written. That, that, that doesn't necessarily translate to the reader. It, that only means that for the author, it was an incredibly meaningful experience where I was going through very many uh, life events, the death of my father, the publication of a controversial novel, um, some problems with drugs, whatever they were. And I was working all of them out in this kind of massive text that I was deeply immersed in. And so for me, getting out of that in the end was just kind of, for myself, amazing. And I really liked, and, and it influenced what I thought about the book. Um, but again, that does not mean that it translates to the reader. And many readers find that book a little confusing, a mystifying at times, uh, a little too surreal. But um, I don't know. To me, it, 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 uh, it meant a lot. There's also, you know, rereading it this week uh, occurred to me, uh, and we had actually many conversations, not only to me, to many other people, uh, it occurred to that there is this very strange link to Paris because... Uh, you talk about this idea that death comes in waves and there is this hotel explosion happening in, in Paris. Can you tell us about that? Well, no, I mean, Glamorama is ultimately, I mean, I wrote it way before Zoolander and uh, it's a serious <laughs> Zoolander in a way where it's about a male model who is um, kind of indoctrinated unknowingly into a terrorist cell. Uh, and is used because he's not that bright and he is also connected, we find out, uh, that his father's a, a, a politician in, in the U.S. And so it's a way to bribe uh, U.S. politician and um, use the son uh, as a, a member of this terrorist cell. And they do. They're, these are young people who we're, we learn the motivation as the book goes on who are part of a much larger terrorist cell who are um, throughout Paris um, attack, blowing up buildings, blowing up hotels, murdering, uh, you know, people's in, there are, sh you know, shootings in cafes and things. And I was writing this actually as kind of, you know, like dreaming it up, thinking that, oh, okay, well, this is kind of surreal or whatever. And, you know, yes. And so, you know, of course, Paris happens. But the other things that happened were, you know, I had all of the characters in the book. Everyone was being f followed by their own reality film crew, which is something that I thought was interesting. And I took that from just basically the real world, which I was watching, this is how long ago this book was written, the first two or three seasons. And so all of the characters have their own kind of reality show in a way, and that was something that I didn't plan on being prescient about, but that's, that's something to me that's also quite suggestive, as well as the obsession with pop culture and with celebrity that we now have. I don't know. There's maybe a, a, another point I 
kind of came to my mind, which is when, when Glamorama came out uh, and one reads the reviews you know, of, of uh, the way the book was received, a lot of people assumed that actually uh, that you were the main protagonist. It was a kind of a misunderstanding. People kind of didn't get that it was a, a fiction. And, you know, when I then read Ben Lerner and... Uh, we discussed this also together in LA uh, earlier this year. Uh, there's a kind of a very interesting movement happening where writers are using themselves as the main character, but it's actually a fiction in a fictional way. Can, can you tell us about that? Um, I, no, I do think that's happening. I think there is this kind of frustration with the traditional narrative, with the, the traditional idea of the novel. And I do, I, 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 look, I did it myself with Lunar Park where I thought it was a much more interesting book if I fused it with my autobiography rather than just writing a kind of imitation of a Stephen King book. Uh, there are many writers who are, who are doing that. Um, ben Lerner, uh, with a recent novel, 1004, which is a really good book, does the same thing. And a lot of writers are um, putting themselves in as characters uh, in their fiction where it could have been a fictional character. And I think it's just because there's a hunger for reality now and for information and the idea of the made-up story, the made-up characters, while still really appealing, I think there's a shift to um, a shift to uh, you know what David Shields calls a kind of hunger reality now, in terms of uh, the arts, in terms of novels, in terms of film, and certainly TV. Alex, what is your favorite work? What is your glamorama? Well, I kind of have this chronic thing where it's always whatever I'm working on at the moment. So um, uh, uh, maybe that's a not an exciting answer, but um, right now it's certainly um, you know the, the upcoming projects, the series of new work with Brett and the new the movie. And maybe that leads to a very last question. It's my only recurrent question in all the interviews, which is we know a great deal about, you know, architects' unrealized projects because they kind of, you know, publish them and at the end of the day very often produce reality by talking about the unrealized projects all the time. But we almost know nothing about artists and, and writers, uh, novelists, poets, unrealized projects. It's uh, uh, the reason I started to always ask about that and we started to build up a kind of an archive, an agency of unrealized projects to kind of um, uh, create more you know, knowledge on these unrealized projects. I wanted to ask you both to maybe tell us about your unrealized project, if you have any kind of utopic projects, projects which were too big to be realized, dreams, maybe projects which were too small to be realized, censored projects, whether it was censorship, or what could be another reason for unrealized. Doris Lessing always told me that there is also the project one didn't dare to do, no? Maybe self-censorship. What, what? What would be examples for your unrealized projects? I mean, I, I hope, I, I try not to think of things that haven't been made yet as unrealized because I hope that I can still make them. I'm, I'm kind of still young, I think. And, um, and so, um, I don't know, I don't really have like a, I, a I think that I, I understand what he's saying too. I really don't feel that I have any unrealized projects. I do have a project that I want to complete and that I want to get uh, as much of it, uh, you know, filled out as possible. Uh, and that is a novel that's uh, kind of a memory novel, uh, touching upon exactly what you mentioned in terms of kind of fusing the fictional and non-fictional with journalistic techniques. Um, but the, the, the real problem is if you are working, or if you were working in Hollywood, is that you have tons of unrealized projects. There are a dozen scripts that don't get made, a mini-series that doesn't get made. I mean, that's really kind of the problem that you figure out if you're, if you're writing in Hollywood or, or trying to make movies, that there are millions of unrealized projects. And that's really kind of when you realize I have to step out of this and take it matters into my own hands. Great, and I see we have two or three more minutes, so a, a little bit more postscriptum. Dan Graham always says um, we can never do an interview with an artist or a writer or a poet or an architect, no matter with whom, without knowing what kind of music they are listening to. What, what music are you listening to? Well, I saw Brett listening to the One Direction album on the plane. 
I was listening to the One Direction album on the plane on American Airlines uh, pop music thing. I was interested in, I was interested in what that record sounded like. Such a, so did, such a good like, album. So yeah, but I, uh, I was, I've been listening to a, a weird uh, guy named John Grant. His, um, I, whatever. That's what that's what that's what I've been listening to in my car in L.A. for the last two weeks. I've been listening to Selena Gomez and Justin Bieber. And then, uh, actually, Elizabeth Chandler, who is here, who invented Goodreads, she says one can never do an interview with a writer or an artist without asking them what they're reading at the moment. Can you tell us about what you're reading right now? Uh, I'm reading a, a stack of galleys from various publishers. The book that I'm... I'm actually reading the Jonathan Franzen novel, Purity, and that's taken... a uh, a long time to read because it's very long, and um, that's and, and I'm reading the uh, new Tom Petty uh, biography. Yes, uh, I'm. I just finished a book um, called Le Freak, which is the Nile Rodgers biography. Oh, I want to read that. It's really good. It's really, I recommend it. And now a very very last question. I promise it's the last one. Rainer Maria Rilke wrote a lovely little book, which is an advice to a young poet. I see many young artists are here with us today. So I was kind of wondering what in 2015 would be your advice to a young writer or to a young artist? Well, my advice would always be just stay true to yourself and just don't follow any other guidelines except <clears throat> your own. And I know I went on a bit of a rant yesterday about how I do see a kind of corporate uh, and which I know you're, I know you're fond of, but a kind of corporate sameness to a lot of the art I see coming out of um, the millennial generation. Uh, I see a lot of appropriation. I see a lot of millennials being what one millennial I know said: "We're not really artists. We're more aesthet aestheticists in a way. We appropriate the art." And if you kind of look at any millennial's Tumblr, for example. It really isn't new art that's being created. It's like doing stuff, mashups with kind of, you know, appropriated images and things like that. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but I do think that there is kind of a need to not, not seek approval. And I do see that again in a lot of art with, with millennials, that they really want approval badly. And so there is a kind of set of rules they feel they have to follow in order to get those likes or those followers or whatever you know, on uh, various social media platforms. Uh, that, I don't know where that ends up. I don't know where the real non-conformist voices that are so important are going to come from that generation. But I do think uh, to kind of reject that notion and to uh, not listen to what other people say and don't crave popularity to that degree uh, is going to probably make for, you know, better, uh, better art. Alex, what would be your advice? Um, the same thing, to be true to who you are and to push yourself um, and to kind of continue to push yourself. Uh, if you get comfortable, to keep pushing. Um, that could not be a more wonderful conclusion. Now it's the moment for thank yous. We are unbelievably grateful, of course, to Mari and uh, to Jessica and the amazing team here for the organization. Very, very grateful to Basel Miami. Very, very grateful to Surface. Very, very grateful to For Your Art. And all our thanks to all of you and, of course, to the great Brett Easton Ellis and the great Alex Israel. Thank you so much.